Good evening, and welcome to the second episode of Cocktails with a Curator. I am Xavier Salomon. I am the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection. And this evening, I would like to talk about one of the most celebrated paintings at the Frick, but also one of my favorites, Rembrandt's Polish Rider. This is a painting that was described by the English art historian Kenneth Clark as one of the great poems of the world. And I think this poetic quality of the painting is still something that's very haunting and that very much touches us today. Since we're traveling to Poland, I would like to pair this painting tonight with a typically Polish drink, which is called a charlotka. And a charlotka is actually uh, an apple pie in Polish, but it also is this very typical drink that people love to have in, in Poland, which is made out of um, two very simple ingredients, but you have to get the right ingredients. One is Polish vodka and the type of Polish vodka that has bison grass in it. The only type of European bison that survives lives in a primeval forest, which is also the last stretch of primeval forest in Europe, a place called Białowieża, which is on the border between Poland and Belarus. And it is an absolutely beautiful, wonderful, wild place. And with the bison grass that comes from that area, they make this deliciously flavored vodka. So you have to use that, and then you have to use um, freshly pressed apple juice or cider. Uh, it's important to have the two right ingredients, um, mix them, have them chilled with a little bit of cinnamon. Of course, if you're under 21 and you can't drink vodka, or if you don't want to drink vodka, you can equally well have a delicious glass of apple cider with a little bit of cinnamon chilled, and it's really, really wonderful. The Polish Rider is a very mysterious painting, haunting, beautiful, poetic. We know very little about it or what it means. It shows a young man on horseback. He is set in a very strange landscape. It's difficult to make out what time of day it is. Is it dawn? Is it dusk? Is it day? Is it night? Behind him, there are a series of buildings, a town, but you can make out very little of it. There is a domed building at the top of the hill. There is a tower below, um, a body of water, maybe a river, a lake, a little group of figures you could just about make out uh, near a fire in the very far distance. But he is resolutely riding across the painting, across the landscape, towards the right. Um, but as he's doing that, he is pausing, he's stopping, he's looking, not quite back, but he's looking past us, out of the frame, uh, in this very puzzling way that has been interpreted in a number of different ways. The man wears a Polish outfit, the hat, the jacket he's wearing, uh, jupan, a typically Polish costumes from the 17th century. And he is also fully armed. Um, he has a series of weapons. There is a bow and arrow of a design influenced by Eastern prototypes that was used um, very much in Poland in the, in the period in the 17th century. He has two sabers, um, one on the left, one on the right. These are of a type known in Polish as a karabela. And he holds in his right hand um, a nadjak, which is actually a strange weapon. It's known as a horseman's pick or a war hammer. And effectively, that's what it is. It's a type of hammer that was used in combat by Polish uh, military figures. But it's also a weapon that was known in the 17th century in Poland because in November of 1620, uh, there was an attempted murder on the, on the king of, of Poland, on, on um, Sigismund III, Vasa. And this drawing shows you the actual uh, nadjak that was used um, to try and kill the king. The king survived, uh, the um, attempted murderer was, was captured and executed. But this is a, is a drawing in the castle in Warsaw that records that weapon. And so this is a weapon that is very much part of um, Polish military and and, and also non-military history at the time. Rembrandt painted this in the mid 1650s, probably around 1655, 56, we don't know for sure. Here he is as the great painter uh, in 1652 in a self-portrait now in Vienna. 
And by the 1650s, Rembrandt was a well-known artist in Amsterdam, a wealthy artist with a large workshop and a very large um, house with a collection of objects. We know he collected costumes and weapons and shells and various exotic objects. But in 1656, Rembrandt goes bankrupt. We know he is not um, very good at managing his money and his life suddenly changes. 1656 is this moment of rupture where suddenly Rembrandt um, is destitute, his house is sold, everything in it goes at auction and his life changes, it changes dramatically. And we don't know if the Polish rider was painted before this event or soon after, but it is around that time. And I think some of the doubtful um, figure in the, in, in the painting may be reflecting somehow um, Rembrandt's own situation in those same years. We don't know who Rembrandt painted the picture for, or we don't even know what he meant for it to represent. But the Polish connection starts um, about 100 years later, when in um, 1791, the Polish aristocrat Michał Oginski, who you see here on the left, um, travels to the Netherlands and on his way back, brings the Polish rider to Poland and offers it for sale to the King of Poland, Stanisław August Poniatowski, the last King of Poland, who you see on the right in a very beautiful portrait by the court artist, Marcello Baciarelli. Stanisław invited to his court a number of foreign artists, Bacciarelli from Rome, but also the famous Bernardo Bellotto, who came from Venice, and started to create a very important art collection in Warsaw, in the royal castle and in his other residences. He was also a great collector of plants and orange trees, and Oginski offers the painting, curiously, in exchange for orange trees, because we know Oginski was building a country house outside of Warsaw at that time, and in exchange for the Rembrandt, he asked for orange trees. So Stanisław August becomes the owner of the Polish rider in Poland in 1791. And he displays it together with other paintings in his collection, including a number of other Rembrandts. And these are two, for examples, that, for example, that he owned, um, two beautiful, um, sort of fancy pictures uh, that are currently uh, at, the, at the castle in Warsaw. Um, and so you have to imagine that the Polish rider entered a group of paintings, a collection that included other great masterpieces such as these. The king decided to display the Polish rider in his favorite residence, the house, the palace at Wazienki, the so-called palace on the Isle. This is a palace that was enlarged and, and, and decorated by him, and it's surrounded on all sides by water. It's in the middle of a lake connected to the land by bridges, and this is um, outside of Warsaw. And uh, the king kept the Polish rider in the anteroom to his private apartments on the upper floor of the house, uh, very close to his study and his bedroom. And the painting remained there for four years. These were very turbulent times for Poland. In 1795, Poland effectively ceased to exist. It is partitioned between Austria, Prussia, and Russia. The king abdicates and moves to Russia to um, where, where he will die three years later in 1798. So the, the, the Rembrandt remains in the house, but it's then sold to um, another family, to, uh, to a, another private collection. This is Valeria Tarnowska, uh, born Stroyanovsky, and it is uh, her father who acquires the painting, but she first describes it in 1811 in her diaries when she sees it at the Wazienki Palace and falls in love with the painting. Her father um, acquires the painting. When he dies, it passes on to Valeria and to her husband, Jan Felix Tarnowski. And the Tarnowski family kept the painting for four generations in their ancestral home, uh, Dzikov, in Galicia, in the southeast of, um, of Poland. This is a photograph of, of Dzikov in the um, late 19th century. This is how the house was redecorated in a, in a sort of neo-Gothic style in the 1830s by the Tarnowski family. It is Valeria's great-great-grandson, Zizław Tarnowski, um, who you see here in this very beautiful portrait by Jacek Malczewski, 
uh, one of the great artists um, of the early 20th century in Poland, a great portraitist. And you have to think this is a painting that's done um, soon after the First World War in the 1920s, uh, where the background still reflects uh, the damage of the war. And you can see there are dead soldiers and soldiers riding um, and, and sort of wounded people in the background. Um, Zdzisław Tarnowski sells the painting in 1910 to Henry Clay Frick. Frick buys it directly from Poland through the advice of the art historian and critic uh, Roger Fry, the English art historian, and, um, and brings it to New York. Tarnowski sells it because at that point, this area of Galicia was under Austrian rule, and many Polish aristocrats were heroically trying to buy back land from the Germans, from the Austrians, to keep as much Polish lands in Polish hands. Uh, of course, this is something that will end up in tragedy with the First and Second World War. Many of these lands will be lost. But it is interesting to think that the Polish rider, so deeply connected to Poland and to the imaginary of, um, of a new nation that didn't exist at that time, actually lived in Poland through a century where Poland didn't exist on a geographical map. Um, the Polish rider between 1791 and 1910 is effectively in a country that doesn't exist. Um, it's in Austria, it's in the Austrian Empire, um, it's Warsaw is under, under Russian rule, it's not in a country that gets recreated at the end of the First World War in 1918. Frick brings the picture to New York. And of course, over the last hundred years, the picture has been one of the great treasures of the Frick collection. But what does this painting represent? Who is this man who is riding across this mysterious landscape? Many theories have been put forward and none of them has ever encountered um, a, a full um, agreement from art historians or, um, or the readers of, of, of these articles and books. Uh, is he uh, a specific human being? Is he a portrait of someone, a Polish man? In which case the format would be somewhat strange. Is this meant to represent a specific historical character, a specific biblical character? The names of King David and Nimrod have been put forward amongst many others. Is he um, a theatrical figure? Is he related to a number of plays that were being performed in Amsterdam in the 1650s and that Rembrandt may have responded to? It's even been argued that it's actually not a man and it's a woman dressed up as a man as it appeared in one of these plays. So the mystery as to the identity of this figure remains. And did Rembrandt even think of it as a specific figure? Is this just a fancy picture? Is this just showing uh, a beautiful youth dressed in exotic um, outfit uh, going um, forward towards the unknown? We don't know. And the mystery remains. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to think about. But I think it's an appropriate thing to think about today as we're all in this strange situation. And what I love about this picture is this sense of mystery and the sense of facing the unknown. And that's what we're doing right now. We are in a world that is changing around us. We don't know where we're going and what will be happening. And I feel a little bit like the Polish rider, sort of going forward and yet looking back and stopping and pausing and puzzling as to what our future holds. I am sure it will hold great things and the world will be hopefully um, a better place in the future and, and we will be out of this situation soon. But the Polish rider for me remains a symbol of this, um, this moment in history where we're stuck in uncertainty and doubt. And I would like to finish with a quote by Julius Held, who wrote probably the most beautiful article on this painting in 1944, in the middle of the Second World War. So he's thinking about this picture, interestingly enough, at a time of uh, great changes and great tragedies in, uh, in human history. And um, one of the things that Hell writes about this painting is um, a sort of description of it, an ideal description. And he says that this is a shining youth who himself seems to be in search of something distant, unmindful of things close and familiar, still withhold from us, like another Lohengrin, the, the, the secret of his name. So we don't know his name. We don't know who he is. 
And yet here he is surrounded by familiar and unfamiliar things um, going ahead towards his future in the same way that we go ahead towards our future. I hope you've enjoyed looking at this picture with me and I hope you're enjoying your charlotka. And um, I look forward to seeing you all next Friday for another Cocktails with a Curator. Thank you.